We've got a very different kind of sponsor for this episode, The Jordan Harbinger Show, which is a podcast you really should be listening to. And I know that every day somebody tells you that you just have to listen to some podcast and you nod and say, sure, and then you never listen to it. Don't let that happen here. Jordan's show, which Apple named one of its best of 2018, is aimed at making you a better informed, more critical thinker so you can get a sense of how the world actually works and come to your own conclusions about what's happening even inside your own brain. Each episode is a conversation with a different fascinating guest. And when I say there's something for everyone here, I really mean that. In one episode, Jordan talks to a hostage negotiator from the FBI who offers techniques on how to get people to like and trust you, which sounds useful and disturbing at the same time. This is a show you guys are going to love. If you were listening to our show a couple weeks ago and you heard that excerpt, where a lady discussed her experience with the Westboro Baptist Church, and you were intrigued, that is the Jordan Harbinger Show, and that's the kind of interview you guys are going to get. Jordan has a true crime starter pack you're going to love. You should jump into this immediately if you haven't listened to it. We love the Jordan Harbinger Show, and we think you will as well. Search for The Jordan Harbinger Show. That's H-A-R-B as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R on Apple Podcast, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. The Jordan Harbinger Show. You will enjoy it. I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are The Prosecutors. Today on The Prosecutors, we begin our look at the interviews that changed this case. Everybody and welcome to this episode of The Prosecutors. I'm Brett, and I'm joined, as always, by my Solari co-host, Alice. That was so beautiful, Brett. It's beautiful. I don't know what Solari yeah. means. I feel like it's like a Vegas show or something. It means sunny. It means oh, sunny. It's your like sunny soul. disposition. Soul. The sun. Exactly. Solari. Solari, like a solarium, well, you know. Well, you know, that's very nice of you to say because even though that was like a really intense thunder we heard an hour ago, no tornado yet. There you go. There you go. It's it's all, you know, if it weren't 10 o'clock at night, it would be all sunshine and, <laughs> and roses outside. I'm so but tired. <laughs> you got to hold on, Alice. This is, those of you who are listening, this is our second episode we've recorded tonight because we're trying to. Go ahead and, and have the second episode, which you guys will be listening to the next day after we recorded the last one. But we're doing them back to back, and Alice is powering through, and she's got this. You can, If you could see her face like so many of our patrons can right now, you would see her sunny disposition, and she is ready to rock and roll. Am I right, Alice, or am I rocking right? Rocking and rolling. Rocking and rocking rolling here. Rocking and rolling. Well, let's just dive right because in. Because I do want to talk about these interviews. Because a lot happens in these interviews. Let's do it. These interviews are important. Okay. And, and we've talked about a lot in this case already. But the thing that drives it are the interviews from various people who came in to talk to the police. The first person we're going to talk about, which will be pretty short, is Adnan himself. Now, Adnan didn't give a whole lot of interviews because at some point he became a suspect. But on February 26th, he did give an interview with the police. Now, this was in his father's presence. This is standard because he's only 17 at the time. And from the descriptions of this in the write-ups, it is incredibly awkward. To a certain extent, I think this sort of plays into some of the stuff we talked about yesterday, this family dynamic. Because Adnan is talking to the police and he's basically whispering because he doesn't want his father who's standing right there to, to hear what he's saying. And in fact, he will 
ask the police for any future interviews if he can have his brother there and not his father there. But he's 17 at the time, and he says that he's known Hay for years and that she had been a good friend of his. When asked whether they are, were in a relationship, Adnan sort of sheepishly says yes, because he doesn't want his father to know about the relationship, which is, it's interesting because... His father does know about the relationship. It's not like this was a secret. It's not like this is something he had managed to keep away from them up to this point. But even now, even at this late date, a couple months after they've broken up, when she is missing and will soon be found dead, or actually I think she had been found dead by this point, he's still sort of holding on to this, this sort of secrecy. Right. He's still sort of being sheepish about this. He's very nervous. He tells police that he had been in Hayes' car before, but he says he wasn't in her car the day of her disappearance. He says he doesn't know anyone who would want to hurt Hay, but he does mention Don Clendenst, who worked with her at Lens Crafters and whom Hay had been dating. And as if we need any more proof, later on, Adnan's going to say he did not realize that Hay had a boyfriend. He clearly did. He knew that... Hey, was dating Don. Yeah, I don't think we can read too much into the fact that Adnan is nervous this day with his dad there. I mean, obviously, Hey, you know, whether she something bad has happened to her or not, has been a source of tension for Adnan and his father at this point. I just think that's, you know, it's got to affect his answers. But obviously, the mentioning of Don is very interesting because obviously we're here pointing fingers. And what we had talked about last episode, at least, was it seems through the defense file that Adnan's hands are in, you know, different parts, at least trying to give an alibi. And by the way, you can have an alibi, even if whether you're guilty or innocent, right? Uh, but we see him kind of planting these alibis everywhere. And here we have that again, where he's pointing the police to look at someone else, Don in this instance, to kind of deflect attention from himself. Another interview that's very interesting and early on is from Jen Pusateri. On February 27th, the police talked to Jennifer Pusateri for the second time. The first time they spoke to her, they walked away thinking that she knew nothing because she said she knew nothing. But now Pusateri comes back with her mother and an attorney present, and she's ready to tell the police everything she knows, and it's not nothing. She's interviewed by Detective McGillivary and Detective Ritz. After some introductions, the officers ask her if she can tell them anything about Hay's disappearance. Jennifer explained that Jay had arrived at her house between 12.30 and 1.30 in Adnan's car, and she knew this because Jay doesn't have a car, and Jay also had Adnan's cell phone. Jay will later tell Jennifer that he had Adnan's car to go pick up a gift for his girlfriend. So Jen and Jay hung out and played video games until about 3.30 p.m., when Jay got two or three calls in a row. This was a call that Jay was expecting. He would told Jennifer he'd be getting a call around 3.30 and at that point he'd have to leave her house. While Jay was there, Jennifer said he wasn't himself. Jennifer said he was uptight, like there was something wrong, but she didn't want to ask him because it was none of her business. Jennifer didn't know who they were or if it was the same person who had called Jay. But between 3.45 and 4.15 p.m., Jay leaves Jennifer's house. At this point, Jennifer goes to pick up her parents and she goes to dinner. At some point, she gets a page or a phone message from Jay asking her to pick him up at a park. It might be leaking, but this point is kind of inaudible in the interview. But then she gets another message telling her he will be late and not to come get him yet. This makes no sense to Jennifer, so she calls Jay to get clarification on what he means. And she's actually surprised when Adnan answers the call. Adnan tells her that Jay will call her when he's ready. She gets that call or that page between 8 and 8.30 p.m. And she is supposed to pick up Jay at the Westview Mall parking lot in front of Value City. A few things that are already pretty compelling about this statement Number one, Jennifer is there with her mother and her lawyer. We've seen a lot of conversations with the police, a lot of interviews with the police. And one thing that people are often concerned about is, are the police coercing these statements? Are there things said when the recorder's not on, where the police are 
telling the person what to say, and then they record it when they're sort of feeding them back what they've already heard. Well, in this case, at least, I mean, this is about as pure as you can get because you got you know you can just imagine you got a lawyer on one side, and mom on the other. So to the extent the police are going to try and manipulate Jennifer, you don't feel like it's going to go very well. You feel like she's walking in with this story. Wherever she got it from, she's walking in with that story. She's not getting it from the cops. The other thing, her sort of general description of Jay's early part of the day fits, that he shows up with Adnan's car, he shows up with his cell phone. This also fits the cell phone pings that we've seen earlier. He's hanging out playing video games. We're going to go through Jay's statement. He talks about this, going to her house and playing video games. And he's going to get some calls around 3.30. This goes to this whole question of what call is the critical call? And the prosecution is going to put the critical call in the 2 o'clock hour. And we've said several times we think that's too early. What well, seems like this initial statement by Jennifer also indicates it's too early. That really that call would have happened after 3 o'clock. And if that's true, if that's the critical call... Then you go back to Asia McLean's statement and you wonder how much it matters whether she's telling the truth or not. Then you have these pages that are coming into Jennifer where she's saying, you know, I, I, he's telling me to pick him up and I'll park. Then he's telling me not to. I'm really confused. She calls him and who answers? Adnan answers. And what do we have at that time pinging from a Lincoln Park telephone tower? We have some incoming calls to the cell phone and jennifer says she calls jay she calls a cell phone number and who does she get she gets adnan he says hey he'll call you back and sure enough he does call her back and we looked at those two calls when we went through the timeline where there are outgoing calls from the cell phone to jennifer that are pinging off of cell phone towers that cover both where hay's car will eventually be found and where hay's body will be eventually found right around this time that jennifer is now saying is when she gets this call from jay to pick him up at a mall parking lot. So Jennifer tells the police that at this point, this was a little weird, but she didn't really think anything of it. And she was supposed to hang out with Jay anyway, and she heads off to the mall to pick him up. When she gets to the mall, things are entirely normal at first. He's Adnan, and he says, and she's, quote, hey, what's up, girl? That's what he says she said. That's what she says that he said. Jennifer describes him as acting normally, exactly the way that she remembered seeing him at school. But it wasn't long before things go sideways. Jay gets into her car, Adnan drives away, and Jay is weird. He is telling her, we need to go. And here's what she says happens next. And I am going to read to you, this is a transcript of her statement. So this is not us paraphrasing, this is exactly what she says. This is pretty long, so, you know... We may stop here or there to break this up a little bit, but this is what she says to the police. Jay got in the car, was like, put on your seatbelt, let's go. I was like, all right. And then he was like, now, Jen, I need you to keep your mouth shut. If I tell you this, and I have to tell you because I don't know, he said, I need to tell somebody. He's like, I'm the only person that knows, and I need to tell somebody. And then the information that he told me was that Adnan had killed Hay, and I was like in complete shock at this point, not knowing, you know, what to do or what to say or anything. I questioned Jay about his involvement, and Jay told me that he had no involvement. All he had done all day with Adnan's car was he needed the car because it was his girlfriend's birthday to go get her a birthday present. That's why he had Adnan. Well, that's what he told me. Adnan's car was to go get his girlfriend a birthday present, and then I asked him, you know, did you help him? Did you do anything? And he said, no. I said, how do you know that he killed her? I was like, I was like, I don't know. How do you know? You know, how is this true? And he told me that he saw Hay's body in the back, in the trunk of a car. I don't know whose car this was, but in the trunk of a car, he saw Hay's body. So let's stop there for a second. Once again, we don't know where this story came from. Maybe it was fed to her. Maybe she made it up. There's a lot about this. This sounds believable. I mean, if you just heard this, if you're just the cops and somebody walked in and told you this story, the way she's telling the story, the way Jay gets into the car and is like, I need to tell somebody this, he's kind of freaking out. And she's one of his best friends, and he just kind of blurts this out. And then he tells her some things that are pretty consistent with a story that we've heard other places. The sort of birthday present, and that's why he needed the car. Seeing the body in the trunk, like... 
all of this stuff is at least consistent with what we're going to hear later from Jay, but also just the story that we know in general. And by the way, this is exactly why we tell you that it's really hard to keep a conspiracy or any sort of crime where more than one person is involved a secret is because this thing happens. Whether you're a hardened criminal or not, and I'm not saying that Jay is, I don't necessarily think Jay, if he had something to do with this, ever did something like this before. But even when you are a hardened criminal, we see that there is this weight on people and they say exactly this. I had to tell someone, I couldn't be the only person in the world who knew this information. This is too big for me to hold by myself. I just need to say it into the world so that I'm not the only holder of this incredibly weighty information. And so that's why what she says is so believable because we've seen this a lot and it happens a lot. And it's usually right after all the adrenaline leaves your body, right? He's probably been pumped with adrenaline and he was waiting for that call from 1230 until 330. That's why he acted weird in Jen's words. And then when he gets the call, he's on adrenaline, on adrenaline, on adrenaline until whatever they were doing was accomplished. And now the adrenaline's leaving his body and kind of his confidence and his everything that makes you able to do something like this, bury a dead body, leaves you and he has to just get it off his chest. And that's what he's doing here. And that's why this this reads very believable to me. Whether Jay was telling the truth or not, I think from Jen's perspective, this reads very believable. She then goes on to say, I said, well, where? And Jay says to me, Adnan's going to get caught. He said he's going to get caught. I said, why is he going to get caught? How's he going to get caught? And Jay said to me that he, from what I understood, Jay told me that Adnan did this in the Best Buy parking lot, which is the Best Buy in Woodlawn over in security. And let me stop here. One thing that's interesting Jay's going to come in and tell the story and he's not going to say it was at the Best Buy parking lot at first. He's going to say it was somewhere else that he met him at like some park and ride or something on some street that I forget the name of it. By the second interview, he's like, yeah, it was at the Best Buy. And he has some reason that he gives for why he didn't tell him the Best Buy the first time, which I didn't really understand. But it's interesting to me that Jennifer from the very beginning is like, yeah, Best Buy. That's where this happened, was the Best Buy. And Jay sort of shifts his story, but everything Jen is telling them, she got from Jay. I mean, you know, this part at least. She is describing what Jay tells her, but the actual events are all coming from Jay. So the only reason she would say Best Buy is because at some point, Jay said Best Buy. This is like after we had left the mall parking lot, then Jay mentioned to me that he knew where Adnan dumped the shovel or shovels. I don't know how many there were, but he mentioned to me that he knew where Adnan had put the shovel and he was like, take me back to Westview Mall parking lot. I pulled back to Westview Mall parking lot and we pulled in the back. Jay got out of the car and walked over towards the dumpsters. As Jay left the car to go over to the dumpster, he told me to sit and watch and see, you know, watch to see if there's mall security, you know, check to see what's going on. Keep a lookout. So that's what I was doing, sitting there watching that. So then after that, Jay came back to the car and he was really shooken up. He's completely shooken up. He was like, you have to take me to go see my girlfriend now. I took him. I'm pretty, I think, I think that's what we did. I think I took him to see Stephanie because he was very concerned for Stephanie's well-being. Another thing I'll just mention here that has always fascinated me about this statement. Once again, she's telling this story with her lawyer sitting right next to her. She's basically admitting accessory after the fact. She's assisting Jay in covering up his role in this crime. Jay will eventually be charged with accessory after the fact for what he did. Now, obviously, Jay is much more involved in the murder itself than Jen is. But I just wonder how that conversation went with her mom and her lawyer. Because, you know, they had to have talked about this. They had to have sat down before they went to the police and been like, this is what I'm going to tell them. There's no way her lawyer lets her walk into that room without knowing what she's going to say to the police. So they've had this conversation. And it's interesting to me that that her lawyer wasn't more concerned about her basically just admitting a crime. And, you know, how this strikes me because her mom is also in there with her is that just like she is describing how Jay acted when he first got in her car saying, I have to tell this to somebody, she probably word vomited to her mom and was like, I need to tell someone something. And her mom was like, this is deep. We need to get a lawyer. And the lawyer got involved and they probably heard the whole story. And depending on tactic, because we've seen different tactics with different attorneys, but she obviously knows a lot of information secondhand. 
And for it to be believable, I think you need to know the whole story. So I can imagine the attorney saying like, yeah, this is going to expose you. But like everything, you know, is secondhand. You need to just be upfront with everything that you have because they don't care about you. They care about Jay or Adnan. I I'm just thinking about what their conversation could have been because otherwise, if she minimizes herself in the beginning, I can see that they start focusing on her and picking her statements apart and thinking, why are you minimizing your involvement? Did you have something to do with the ultimate murder, not just the accessory after the accessory to the accessory after the fact? Yeah, that's a good point. And, and I bet you can imagine how this went down. Jay tells her this. She she says various things to people. We went when we went through the timeline. We talked about when Jen would tell various people that Hay was strangled, which she wouldn't have been able to know. That when the body was found in the park, she said, if that person was strangled, I bet it's hay. So she didn't keep it all to herself. When the cop showed up at her door to ask her whether she knew anything, I can only imagine she was already probably stressed out about this and about what Jay had told her. Then the cops show up and they're like, do you know anything about this? And she says, I don't know anything about it. And then as soon as they left, she probably freaked out. And you're right. She probably went straight to her mom and said, I have to tell you this. And I can imagine the lawyer... After she first said to the police, I don't know anything. So clearly she's already lied to the police, right? There's not only just admitting to be an accessory after the fact, she's also kind of admitting that she lied to the police already. Not a great thing. You know, she could be charged if they wanted to. But I can imagine that the police, in addition to saying well, we have to tell them the whole story, is to make this believable, her admitting to her, some involvement in it makes her whole story believable because the police weren't looking at her. They weren't saying, hey, your story doesn't check out, Jen Pusateri. We want to talk to you again. She brings it up herself. She is admitting when they didn't know that she knew more to come in and tell a story that implicates herself even more than before because before she could have just stayed quiet and probably no one would have known she knew more. Jay didn't say anything about Jen Pusateri. So the police were not knocking down her door. I can imagine that the police hearing this whole story, they're like, this is all secondhand. This is all hearsay. But man, why would you be telling of this, this story that puts you in a really bad light, in a way worse light than the first time we talked to you if you didn't actually hear something and know something and you're telling us what you heard? Whether what you heard is true or not, this is really what you heard. She then goes on to say, he didn't want Adnan to ever talk to Stephanie again. He didn't want Stephanie to talk to Adnan again, but he didn't know how to tell Stephanie not to talk to Adnan. Because if he said something like that to Stephanie, then she's going to be like, why? He's my friend. Why can't, you know? And Jay doesn't want to have to explain anything. He would not tell anybody, anyone that he knew, because he didn't want Adnan. He didn't want, he told me not to tell anyone because he was concerned. Not that Adnan would necessarily come after him, because I guess, as far as I know, and as far as Adnan knows, the only person that knows anything about this is Jay. I don't think Jay has went back to Adnan and told Adnan that he's told me. I don't know. And Jay, Jay came, took, I think I took Jay to Stephanie's house. After we had left Stephanie's house, we went to my friend Christie's and stayed there for the remainder of the night. Well, I told, we went home for the evening. Yeah. Inaudible that night. And this is consistent with a couple things. I think Stephanie has said this, that Jay came to see her that night. And Christy, you may recall, one of her memories of this night, and another reason this day was so striking to her, was after Jay and Adnan showed up earlier and then like left in a huff mysteriously, then Stephanie and Jen show up and they're completely weird the whole time. And then they leave in sort of a similar circumstance, which you know, lend some credibility to something weird is going on with Jay and Jen that night. She then goes on to say, I don't know what time I came in that evening. Probably pretty late. I usually come in pretty late, between 12, whatever. And then the next day, I'm not sure what. I'm assuming the next day I would have the 14th, I would have went to work, do my normal routine again, unless it was a Saturday or Sunday. And then I, I went and saw Jay later. Sometime the next day on the 14th, I saw Jay and he asked me to take him I remember it was raining this day. He asked me to take him to F&M parking lot or F&M. He had to go to F&M. I drove him to the back of F&M. He got out of the car, took his boots and his clothes that he had on the night and put everything in the dumpster. The only other thing I know, only other thing that Jay told me was I was like, hey, you know what? You know, what's how's this going down? What is going on? He told me that he was talking to Adnan a couple days before any of this happened. And from what I understand 
and he was talking to Adnan a couple days before any of this happened, and Adnan asked Jay if he knew of anywhere to put a body. And Jay told Adnan, possibly Patapsco State Park, and and told me that he said no, he would know nowhere to put a body like that. Jay also told me that Adnan asked him to help bury the body, and Jay told him that he did not help Adnan bury the body. That's what Jay said. And remember, there was this whole Patapsco State Park thing we talked about earlier where this question of could you possibly bury somebody there Patapsco State Park comes up later in one of Jay's statements where he says they went and smoked a blunt in Patapsco State Park and this has always been one of those things that's like it's unclear when they went to Patapsco because they didn't do it that day there's just really no way for the timeline to work and so people have really tried to figure that out and I wonder if based on what Jen is saying and Jay sort of telling Adnan, and she doesn't mention Patapsco in this statement, but I wonder if Jay and Adnan had smoked a blunt at Patapsco State Park sometime earlier, and during that conversation had sort of talked about this. And even if Jay just thought Adnan was blowing off steam, that might have been a conversation they had, and that sort of gets incorporated by Jay into his story later on, and that's where Patapsco comes from. That's one of those sort of mysteries in this case, is why he even brings up Patapsco. And it just makes me wonder if that's sort of the explanation for that. So you guys have heard me talk about my new baby and how I have three kids to do laundry for now, which is a lot of laundry. Have you ever wondered why laundry detergent comes in massive plastic jugs? Who wants that? 91% of those inconvenient, awkward, heavy jugs end up in landfills and oceans, harming our planet and marine life. There has to be a better way. And it's not like you can just stop doing laundry. So do what I did. Switch to EarthBreeze. My new EarthBreeze laundry detergent eco sheets look like dryer sheets, but they're not. It's a revolutionary liquidless laundry detergent that dissolves 100% in any wash cycle, hot or cold. No measuring, no mess, and no heavy plastic jugs. Just toss the sheet in. And EarthBreeze has made the whole concept of detergent better. The packaging is lightweight, biodegradable, and plastic-free. And I can tell you, my kids are dirty, and these eco sheets work amazingly. The clothes come out smelling great and are clean. If you guys have been listening to this show, you know that Mrs. Brett is the toughest judge of them all. If she doesn't like something, she lets me know. Well, she loves... Earth Breeze. And she loves it for a reason, because not only are you saving space and doing something that's good for the environment, you still get a powerful clean. Earth Breeze is tough on stains, fights odors, and your clothes come out clean every time. So switch from the old-fashioned goo to something new. Right now, our listeners can subscribe to Earth Breeze and save 40%. Go to earthbreeze.com slash prosecutors to get started. That's earthbreeze.com slash prosecutors for 40% off. Do not miss this deal. earthbreeze.com slash prosecutors. I know you guys are a little bit tired of hearing how I am so busy with my three kids, being back at work and doing two podcasts. I don't have time to go shop for myself and I don't have time to know what is the fun, fab things that are out there. But guess what? Someone is curating all that for me and that's fab, fit, fun. And here's your free beauty and lifestyle hack. Fab Fit Fun is the best way to save money on beauty and lifestyle products from the brands you love, discover new brands, and treat yourself to something nice without overpaying. I haven't bought myself jewelry in God knows how long. And when my Fab Fit Fun box came, these adorable earrings came, and oh my goodness, I'm wearing them now. All of you watching on YouTube can see them. I absolutely love them, and I didn't have to leave my house to buy them. That's the best part. As a FabFitFun member, you get exclusive access to shop thousands of curated products from top lifestyle products and brands like Fenty, Kate Spade, and many more for up to 70% off. And I'm going to share one more thing I got in my box that I'm so excited about, and y'all are going to call me such a mom. I got a fanny pack from Obey and a workout app that goes with it. I am so excited about all of the things that came in my box. And Alice, I totally got the fanny pack too, so no shame. No shame. And what is their secret? With over 1 million members, FabFitFun helps brand growth by placing massive orders with big promotions. In exchange, the brands offer up early access, exclusive drops, and steep discounts on the most sought-after 
products. So what are you waiting for? Sign up at fabfitfun.com slash prosecute. Customize your box and get access to discounts up to 70% off brands like Fenty, Free People, and Our Place, to name a few. Not in love with this season's options? Take the credit to shop their exclusive flash sales of up to 70% and save on the biggest name brands out there. If you join FabFitFun as a new seasonal member right now, you'll also get 20% off your membership. So your first box is only $47.99 for up to a $300 value box each season but only while supplies last fab fit fun boxes sell out join fab fit fun today and save at fabfitfun.com slash prosecute that's fabfitfun.com slash prosecute angie has made it easier than ever to connect with skilled professionals to get all your home projects done well if you own a home, you know how much work it can take. Whether it's everyday maintenance and repairs or making dream projects a reality, it can be hard just to know where to start. But now, all you need to do is Angie that and find a skilled local pro who will deliver the quality and expertise you need. And Alice, you can turn to Angie with confidence no matter what the size of your home or the size of your project. Whether you've got a 100-year-old house like I do where it seems like things are always breaking or if you're renting and you're needing someone to help you with moving Moving, installations or cleaning, Angie is there for you and they're there for you with confidence. So Angie has over 20 years of home service experience and they've combined it with new tools to simplify the whole process. Bring them your project online or with Angie's app, answer a few questions and Angie can handle the rest from start to finish. Or they can help you compare quotes from multiple pros and connect instantly which means you can take care of just about any home project in just a few taps because when it comes to getting the most out of your home you can do this when you angie that download the free angie mobile app today or visit angie.com that's a-n-g-i.com check them out today angie.com a-n-g-i.com so basically from Jen's statement to the police the second time, it's possible just when you kind of combine it with all of Jay's different interviews and his different stories that Jay's probably minimizing his involvement a little bit in the way he talks to Jen. But I think this is really what Jen hears, right? Because Je everything in Jen's statement is really all secondhand, except for the places that she drove Jay and what she heard Jay said. Otherwise, she's really just repeating to you what she heard from Jay. And Jay, even if he's blowing off steam, could be minimizing his involvement to Jen, or he could just be talking so fast and she have no context and at the time not be able to fully absorb everything. But I really do think the way she told this, you can tell it's kind of run on sentences. It's very rushed almost, even though we, we're, we're reading it to you, but th thoughts are run together and, and she's trying to like get out as much of her memory as she can before she loses kind of the, the string because she wants to get it all out of her mind because it's probably a huge burden on her that I really do. It doesn't, none of this seems like she made up any of it, but of course she's getting all her information from Jay. So Jen tells this story in one long dialogue that you just heard and the police just let her go. That's it. <laughs> they don't interrupt her. They don't ask questions until she's more or less just like word vomited all of the story out. You read that. That was like one long run on paragraph. But after she's finished, they ask questions that essentially lead her to tell the story again. She tells essentially the same story, though the words she uses and the quotes she gives from Jay are not exactly the same. And this is what you would expect from someone telling a true unrehearsed story. It's really hard to remember quotes exactly. If you say a quote exactly in at different points in your interview, it sounds like you've rehearsed it. You probably have because we generally remember conversations and phrases and words and what people say to us as like the overall feeling and the genre of, of what's coming at you. You don't really remember specific words. And so the way she is asked basically the same story from a different angle and she tells the same story, but with different words is what you would expect from someone who does not rehearse their story. And uh, let me just say ahead. this about the police, because I think there's one thing that's worth pointing out as Alice just did. So I'm going to repeat what Alice said, because Alice is always right. So the fact the police, you can criticize the police all you want in this case. They do exactly the right thing here. They let her tell the whole story. Like you can't say that the police 
coached her, led her, interrupted her to correct her and, and point her in the right direction. There's no tapping on the table when Jennifer is telling her story. The police are just letting her tell it. And she tells it. And then her attorney's there, too. <laughs> and her attorney's there and her mom's there on the other side. And then they do what you're supposed to do, which is get her to tell the story again. Because that's what you're really that's when you're really trying to tell, you know, is this is this real or are you just making this up? And that's a really effective way of doing it. And the reason you do that, we do this all the time, is because you're trying to see what they're seeing, right? When you're looking at a flat figure, like a flat picture, and that's kind of the metaphor for something that you've rehearsed or something you've made up. It's one dimensional. There's nothing more to it than what you said. I told you, this is exactly what I said. There's no backstory. There's no additional embellishment because there's nothing more to my made up story. But when you are recalling a memory or an experience, it's 3D. It's 4D, right? There are, there are senses. There's the smell. There's the taste. There's the, the senses that you can feel with every part of your body. So when you tell the story and you're asked questions about a particular part of that story, you're able to pull in all your senses and basically tell that same part of the story from a different perspective. Think about like if you're watching a movie and instead of like a one lens flat shot, you're seeing it from multiple different camera angles. That's a true memory is one where you can come from different camera angles because you have all the senses in living through that memory. And that's what the police are doing here. And that's what is effective interrogation is to ask it in a way that evokes a different sense so that they tell the same story from a different perspective. Because if they can do that, it is a better indicator that this is the truth. So Jennifer asked Jay why Adnan had done this, remember? And he replied that Hay had broke his heart. The police also ask about earlier in the day, and Jennifer relates to what she knows about their day at school, which is rather vague. She says, quote, I know that Adnan went to school sometime during the day, sometime during the morning. I want to say in the morning he went to school or something because he was supposed to be in school the whole day. So I think that Jay took him to school and stuff. And I also think that Jay took him to maybe some kind of practice. I don't know if Adnan did anything at Woodlawn or not as far as sports goes. But I think that at eight o'clock when I talked to Jay, I think because he told me the entire story of everything that happened during the day, but I don't remember all of it. I remember that he said that Adnan said that he did it in Best Buy parking lot. He said that he saw Hay's body in the trunk of a car. And he said, I remember him mentioning something about taking Adnan to school. I remember him mentioning something about picking up Adnan from school after practice or before practice or taking him to practice before practice started. He had some kind of practice or something like that. That's all the information that Jay knew about the day that I can remember. The way she says this, so believable. I mean, she even mentions, I don't even know if I'm misremembering the practice thing. Practice is just sticking out in my mind. So I'm telling you something about practice before, after, during. Does he even have practice? Does he do anything at Woodlawn? I don't even know. I mean, this is so on point with someone who's trying to remember a story they've been told and not being fed the lines. Look, of all the things in this entire case, this is the most believable paragraph anybody said. Everything about it is believable. Look, maybe Jay killed Hay and for whatever reason and then told Jen this entire story. That's a possibility. What I know for certain is Jen didn't make this up. Jen didn't make this up and she didn't get this from the cops with her lawyer sitting next to her. And this is so incredibly believable because it's all over the place. Like there, the highlight she hits, but she doesn't really, the whole, like, I think he practice some sort of practice. I don't know if he played any, like you can imagine if you were showing up there to, to sell a line to the cops, you'd have the sport. <laughs> you know, like you would know what sport you're going to lie about. Right. But she doesn't do that. And she, just in this paragraph, she hits all the important things. Jay took him to school. He killed her at the Best Buy. He saw the body in the trunk. He dropped Adnan off at some sort of practice. She doesn't know what. So this is secondhand, and it's hearsay what she's saying, but she's not making this up, and she wasn't fed this by the cops. No. Again, not with her... Not with her attorney and her mom there. <laughs> I just I think that's so in important to know because we hear so many people say the allegations of the police coaching for these different interviews. She was not coached, not with two people present there, one being her mother, who probably was the one who said we need to call an attorney and then her attorney as well, who is, you know, obviously barred and able to 
see the things that we cannot see because we're reading the transcript. So Jen tells this very long-winded story and the police ask a great question. They said, how can Jen remember the date that all of this happened? And she explains that it was the only day Adnan had ever called her. Police had earlier asked her why Adnan called her on the 13th. So it's not so much that she remembers the 13th. She remembers the day that Adnan called her. And we know from cell phone records that it's the 13th. Yeah. And then in another sort of twist on this, that I think makes her even more believable. Jennifer is surprised. She herself expresses surprise that Jay would help Adnan. And this is one of those things, you know, when you think about this case, one of the questions that everybody asks is why would Jay even do this? Why would he even be involved in this? And Jen doesn't really have a very good answer for that. When the cops ask her, she says, I don't think that Jay would lie to me, first of all. So she thinks Jay's telling her the truth. And like, I don't know, unless Adnan paid Jay a good sum of money, I really don't see Jay helping him, which is so funny because she's basically saying, well, I don't think he's lying, but I don't really know why he would do this, you know, and maybe he paid him some money, which he didn't. I mean, we know that, but it's just such a, once again, the kind of statement from somebody that makes everything else they say more believable. Because of the way she puts it. And remember, while she doesn't know Adnan that well, so she doesn't really care. And maybe she, you know, you, you can say she's making something up because she hates Adnan and wants him to get in trouble. Maybe. But we do know she's good friends with Jay. And this whole statement is bad for Adnan, but it's also really, really bad for Jay. And so why would she make something up that hurts her friend a ton of, of everyone we've talked about so far? She is just incredibly believable to me. She may have been lied to, but she is believable in what she's saying. I don't think she made up any part of this statement. And it reminds me, we talked about when we did Murder and Alliance, and there was, there was just one statement from one random person that happened at a time that could not have happened if the person who'd been convicted was innocent. And it's, it's reminds me of that. It's like Jennifer is just, there's really no reason for her to be making this up. Like you said, you, you almost have to construct some sort of strange thing where either she and Jay did it together. And this is like some really convoluted, complicated way of, of blaming Adnan or Jay did it and is blaming Adnan. And she is just sort of the conduit for it. Because, as you said, just everything she says, I don't know if what she's saying is true, but she isn't making it up. So it may be that the things she is being told by Jay are all lies, but she believes it. And she is telling what she was actually told to the police. Jen describes the relationship between Jay and Adnan as casual. They know each other through high school and through Jay's girlfriend, Stephanie. Jennifer explains that they don't hang out that much because she sees Jay every day and she doesn't see Adnan. So she knows he's not with Jay a lot. She describes her relationship with Jay as extremely close, brother and sister-like, and that she trusts him with her life. Now, the police are surprised by this. They don't understand Jennifer's description of the relationship between Adnan and Jay. As one detective says, why would Adnan go to a casual acquaintance like Jay and say, I just killed a girl? I want you to help me bury her. Jennifer speculates that Adnan knew Jay was a loyal person he could trust. Adnan was obviously much closer to Stephanie, and Jennifer thought that he could have led Jay to believe that the closeness between Jay and Stephanie could have led him to believe that Jay would help him because he's so close to Stephanie. The police asked Jennifer whether she had considered going to the police earlier. She said that she'd heard from a friend that the police believed the man who found the body might be a suspect. That's Alonzo Sellers. Jennifer said that at that point, she goes to Jay and both of them were concerned. And Jay said, we can't let the wrong person go down for this. At the time, they didn't take any action, but the whole thing had weighed on Jennifer. The police also asked Jennifer about Hayes' car. They tell her, we can't find the car despite a lot of looking. Jennifer, unfortunately, doesn't have a whole lot of information on that. And look, I mean, there's a lot going on here. Jennifer's story, and, and I think Alice and I have, have said this a couple times, it is powerful and it is hard to overcome if you think neither Jay nor Adnan are involved in this crime. If you think this is some sort of third person, Jen's story is hard to get around. And the, the people attack it because it does contradict itself at times. Jen, she doesn't seem to know everything that she should. 
Her times aren't great. She's kind of all over the place with times. All the reasons you would expect, but that's actually why, frankly, that I find it to be so powerful. As we've said several times, her not knowing everything and not having the perfect statement actually makes it seem more like a real story from a real teenager, one that she would tell, not one that the police would concoct or that her and Jay would have made up before she goes in it has surprising things in it like the fact that adnan and jay aren't close jen knows that jay took adnan to some sort of practice but she has no idea what kind of practice it is those are the kind of things that just make you think man this feels like a real story and jen doesn't know where the car is if this is the police trying to like set her up and get her to move this case forward where they're going to you know they're going to frame adnan or they're going to frame jay either way and they're going to give somebody the car. Why didn't they give it to Jen? But apparently she doesn't know where the car is. And if the police know, they don't tell her. And why would she lie? What is her motive? You know, if she's lying, what would be her motive to do that? Now, she has no firsthand knowledge. All she has is what Jay told her. But it seems like Jay definitely told Jen this story, even if... It was just to cover up his own responsibility for the crime. One thing I'd like to note, though, unlike... So, obviously, the truthfulness of what Jen is saying depends on whether Jay was telling her the truth. But unlike when Adnan is kind of calling Nisha or telling Ali, maybe telling Ali, that he called Nisha and then putting Jay on the phone to create an alibi, Jen's story of what Jay has told her does not sound to me in the same way of Jay trying to create an alibi. So it'd be really confusing for Jay to tell Jen a made up story that now implicates Jen in some sort of accessory after the fact. And when no one is yet looking at Jay as the suspect, right? It'd be weird to kind of write or create a story that gives you some sort of criminal liability just that's just a little bit less than murder when no one was looking at you at the time and then to kind of pull in one of your close friends because so if he's not close to adnan it does seem like he's close to jen close enough that they hang out on a regular basis that he's the person that she that she is the person he would confess something to and she seems to know him very well so to pull in your friend as well, who truly had nothing to do with this entire, you know, fiasco seems very strange. So I do note that if he's trying to create an alibi, it do he doesn't tell her, like, make sure you tell other people. In fact, he's saying, don't tell anybody else. Like, I just have to get this off my chest. He's not telling her this in a public place. He's not telling her to tell other people. He seems to just be unloading. Whereas when Adnan was trying to create an alibi, it seemed he was trying to put himself in places where other people could then testify later on that he was there. In fact, all of this happens after the fact, seeming more like the word vomit out of an emotional response rather than creating an alibi at the same time or ahead of time. No, I think that's right, Alice. And this is going to be a little bit of a short episode today because this is your second episode this week. But next week, we're going to move on to Jay and we're going to talk about Jay's statements that he made. We're going to go through them, show how they contradict each other at certain points, talk about some of that, see what shakes out of it. But to me, the Jay statements are interesting. The Jen statements where it's at. Because the fact, I just, I can't, as someone who with Alice has sat in a lot of rooms, talking to a lot of witnesses with a lot of lawyers, I just can't get past the fact the lawyer is sitting right there. You know, that that is, it is just, that is not the, there's a reason, there's a reason in every cop show that they're disappointed where someone invokes their right to counsel. And it's not because the lawyer is going to come there and tell him, why don't you just tell him everything? That's not what normally happens. So the fact that they show up with the lawyer and tell the story to me is just it's a really powerful moment in this case. And I feel like it's something that gets a little lost in Jay's, you know, his statements. And, and maybe we're going to commit that same sin next week, but we're going to talk about those statements as well. No, one thing, whether he said it truthfully or not, for the first time, I kind of got a gut punch about Jay. When Jen says Jay and hearing that Alonzo Sellers was a suspect saying we can't let the wrong guy go down for this. I mean, obviously, if the right guy goes down for it, Jay is absolutely implicated in part of it. And it's not going to be great for him either. And so that was kind of a very humanizing moment for me with respect to Jay when Jen said that about Jay. Yeah. And, you know, Jay had been around the block enough. I think he would have known that 
there's going to be some consequences for him in all this if they go. Jen, as we've talked about, was probably good to go. Had a lawyer. The other thing, you know, I mean, look, we haven't really talked about Jay, but, you know, Jen's, her mom's there. You know, Jay, he had a pretty rough life. He didn't have a whole lot of people to rely on in his life. And, you know, he he's an, he's an interesting character in this case, whatever you think about how this eventually went down. Well, Alice, do you have time for a question or do you need to run off? I know the we're no, I, on bar time. We, we have the monitor here. She will wake up soon, but she's not yet awake. Probably okay. one question. Okay. Well, let's do let's do one question, and let's see. Okay, this is a good one. This is from Jesse Jackson. If you could relocate to anywhere in the world tomorrow, where would you live? Do you want me to answer that first, or do you want to answer? No, that? you get to go first. That's hard. That's the a whole tough question. world is tough. The whole world. Because there's the like, I have no responsibilities or kids or need to work for a living. And then there's like, realistically, where would I want to live? So I'm going to say, first, I'm going to say in the United States, I'm going to break this into two questions. If I could live anywhere in the world and I'm rich and therefore, you know, can jump on a private jet and fly anywhere I want to go, I would live in Boston in a heartbeat. I love Boston. My heart is in Boston. Really? You like the cold like that? I love the cold. I love Boston winters. I love everything about Boston, except for the fact it is so far from Alabama. That is the one the one problem with Boston. It might as well be on the moon. It's so far away. But if you're giving me like a jet, I can jump on up in Manchester or at Logan and just fly wherever I want to go. Boston. Boston's my favorite city in the United States, and it's not even close. So that's that's the United States. In the world, and I'm once again fabulously wealthy. I'm assuming fabulous wealth here. Tokyo. I love Tokyo. Tokyo. I did not see that coming. I thought you were going to say like Ireland or Scotland or something. I love Ireland and Scotland. I know. I, absolutely I know do. you do. <laughs> but I love Tokyo so much. It's just the greatest uh, city in the world. Okay. So truly in the entire world, and we've talked about this before, I'm a, my parents are immigrants. I would probably still want to live here in the United States because I have cousins who live on like four continents and I get to visit them a good bit and they're really interesting places. But I think ultimately to live... I really am so happy to be here. And part of that might just be because I've been able to experience so much of the world that they're great places to visit. And I see my like, you know, extended family's life in those different countries, but I'm happy here. With that said, I do love the seasons. You're right. But I can't venture so far up to Boston because that is really cold. But where I went to college in the Blue Ridge Mountains is like in the middle of nowhere with a town of like 8,000 people it is just so idyllic. It was beautiful. When I lived on the East Coast, I would go back there all the time and just like we would go to a cabin in the middle of nowhere and like hike the Blue Ridge Mountains. It smelled like pure, beautiful air. But I think really, really, really where I want to be is where my friends are. And I don't know what city that is in. So if I could get all my friends to move there, then I'd be happy, you know. But in terms of like weather and like the beautiful nature of it all, it would be the Blue Ridge Mountains. It's wonderful. Kristen in the chat asked if I would be a Celtics fan. I am a Celtics fan. I don't know what you're talking about. I'm a fan of all Boston <laughs> sports. I'm a Bruins fan. I'm a Celtics uh, fan. I'm a Revolution fan. The Patriots, the Red Sox. Oh, my all gosh. Of it. <laughs> well, we had just enough time for one question. Oh, Look at her letting us do two episodes. There you go. Well, we will we'll wrap it up now so Alice can get to her baby. You guys know how to get in touch with us. I'm not going to repeat it now. We'll be back next week with Jay. But until then, I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are the prosecutors. The prosecutors. The prosecutors. The prosecutors. The prosecutors. The Prosecutor. If I was a billionaire, I'd drop $250,000 on whatever I wanted. To go a to the miniature t- I mean, I like elephant. Oh. Who cares? That's like a drop in the bucket. That's nothing. But but of all the things you could, because like two hundred fifty thousand dollars, you're a billionaire. 
No, it's not. <laughs> not for you. If you're a billionaire, money is not finite. You could never spend that I money would, in your entire life. I would life. tip someone two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Fine, at tip a them two hundred fifty thousand dollars, and then get into go that spend two hundred fifty thousand dollars to get on the submarine. I'd be like, I am the nicest person ever. I've changed this person's life. I'm going to tip you two hundred fifty thousand dollars, and nobody tip dies. Everyone you saw two hundred fifty thousand dollars and still go on the submarine. <laughs> it wouldn't matter. It's like, <laughs> okay. Anyways. And so he's like screaming. And so I'm the only one who can like strong arm him enough to like get the eardrops in his ears. And he's like sitting there holding onto my leg and stroking it while I like force eardrops into his ears. And he goes, Mama, why are your legs so pokey? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, enter prosecutor's ad about razors. Oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> the biggest blockbusters this summer with Popcorn Summer Movies on Pluto TV. Experience non-stop action with the first four Mission Impossible movies and Top Gun. Laugh out loud to comedies like Anchorman, The Legend of Ron Burgundy, and The Backup Plan. With thousands of free movies, Pluto TV has something for everyone. Available on live TV and on demand. Download Pluto TV on all your favorite